The beautiful statue behind me is that of the Russian Emperor, Peter the Great, here in the city which he founded, St. Petersburg, now called Leningrad. Peter called his port city Russia's window to Europe. Hello, I'm Bert Lancaster. Let me tell you something about Leningrad's fascinating history. In 1917, Leningrad was the site of the October Revolution, which signaled the end of the Tsarist regime and the beginning of the Soviet state. When Lenin died, the city was renamed in his memory. In the history of the unknown war, Leningrad stands out as a symbol of the courage and persistence of the Russian people. For days, weeks, months, years, Leningrad resisted capture by Hitler's forces. In the aching cold of winter, with nothing to eat, no way to keep warm, hundreds of thousands of Leningraders perished from starvation or simply froze to death. Still, they fought on. During the terrifying siege, which the Russians call the 900 Days, Nazi troops encircled the city and cut off all communications. But Leningrad would not surrender. And now, that story. The Siege of Leningrad. Founded by Peter the Great on the marshes of the Neva River. One of the world's most beautiful cities, often called the Venice of the North. An extraordinary city that enjoys a very special place in the hearts of its citizens. Leningraders are the heirs of a unique past. They are ordinary people, ordinary men, women, children. Like people everywhere, they fall in love, marry, raise families. In 1941, there were over two and a half million people in Leningrad. For them, the war would be different. Success or failure would depend as much on their strength as on the brilliance of the generals. Two and a half million Leningraders. One out of every three of them would die of starvation, of bombs, of shells, of sub-zero cold. They would die by the hundreds of thousands, men, women, children. Within days of the Nazi attack on Russia, on June 22, 1941, Lithuania and Latvia had been overrun, and the Germans were moving deliberately on Leningrad with over a million troops, 600 tanks, and a thousand planes. Their allies, the Finns, were also poised for the attack north of the city. Nazi panzer divisions smashed into ancient Piskov, crushing everything in their path. to Leningrad was in flames. The symbols of Russian culture and style were known to the world. In this cradle of Russian scholarship and art, the poet Pushkin wrote. The composer Mussorgsky wrote his music in Leningrad. Pavlov experimented with dogs and conditioned reflexes. The ballerina Pavlova danced in classical ballet for Russian Grand Dukes. It was in Leningrad that Lenin and the Bolsheviks changed the world's political structure in 1917. The German army group Nord was expected to conquer Leningrad in four weeks 
by July 21st, 1941. On the ground were the 16th and the 18th field armies and the 4th tank group of the Wehrmacht. Hitler was determined to capture Leningrad quickly and then send the same forces to envelop Moscow. The Nazi performance in the initial stage of the attack gave Hitler every reason for confidence. He had taken the enemy once again, completely by surprise. In command was Field Marshal Ritter von Lieb. Hitler predicted, at the first blow, the Russian army will experience a defeat greater than the one suffered by the French army. Leningrad was to be the first great Soviet city to fall. In all her long history, Leningrad had never been invaded. Now her children prepared to defend her. In the very first days of the war, hundreds of thousands of Leningraders enlisted for military service. They were formed into units of Opelchenia, the home guard, ill-trained, ill-armed. More had volunteered, but could not be spared from vital war industry plants. They marched off confidently almost all of them to their deaths. They were fighting for time, time to build defenses. Into the birch forests, into the battle. The first line of defense was gouged from the earth at Luga, 125 miles west of the city. It would stop the Germans for a few weeks. There was a second line at Gacina, some 20 miles outside the city. The innermost line of barricades, 22 miles long, ran along the city limits. The defense lines were built by men and women many of whom were unused to physical labor. Many of them middle-aged, not a few of them in their late 60s and 70s. The white kerchiefs of the women made them easy targets. Low-flying Nazi planes took a heavy toll of the unarmed men and women as they labored in the fields. In all, they put up 350 miles of defense works, 15,000 bunkers. It took nearly a half a million people to build them. Leningraders would be able to walk to the front line, just a block or two from the last streetcar stop. Now the city was on a war footing. Leningraders saw everything. The sky, the landscape, the killing ground. Through the slits of their bunkers. The unknown war will continue in a moment. The siege of Leningrad. The storm was drawing near. Hitler had announced the city was to be wiped off the face of the earth.
I pulsed with the rustle of wings, many wings. attacks on Leningrad had begun September 6th, but the first intensive raid was September 8th. The Germans came that night in two main waves. The first wave at 6.55 p.m. dropped over 6,000 incendiary bombs. At 10.35 p.m., a second wave of bombers dropped high explosive bombs of 500 to 1,000 pounds. That day's air raid destroyed the Badayev warehouses, the city's main stockpile of food. It was an evil omen. Food was soon to become more precious than bullets. With the bombs, the Nazis dropped leaflets. Today we shall do the bombing. Tomorrow you shall do the burying. <laughs> Nazi raids on Leningrad came like clockwork. Some of the bombs were delayed action missiles. They were handled with care, but not always successfully. Hitler declared, the war against Russia is a war of ideologies. The capture of Leningrad will deprive the Russians of the symbol of their revolution. Marshal Voroshilov, commander of the Leningrad armies, proclaimed from the beleaguered city that Leningrad would become Hitler's grave. The Soviets struck out from Luga desperately and succeeded in turning the German thrust northward. But the circle of steel was quickly closing around Leningrad. Von Halder, chief of the German general staff, made some ominous notes in his diary. The Russians don't think of retreating. The news from the front says again that the Russians fight to the last man everywhere. Their men fight desperately and fanatically. But in spite of these observations, von Halder concluded that the Russian campaign was won. Leningrad held on. However, in September, the situation became more difficult. The fascists broke through the defenses, cut across the railroads, and reached the shore of Lake Ladoga. Leningrad was besieged. In a final effort to save Leningrad, Stalin ordered Marshal Zhukov to the beleaguered city. The situation was almost hopeless. Zhukov worked with Andrei Shdanov, head of the Leningrad party organization. The enemy could already see the spires and domes of Leningrad. Van Lieb launched his attack early in September with complete tank and air supremacy. Zhukov reached out for more reserves. The sailors of the Baltic fleet were called out to fight as infantry battalions.
they marched to the front with a mother's blessing. Zhukov pulled together a striking force of 50,000 men and launched his counterattack. He ordered, hold or die. One of his men said to a comrade, if you retreat, I will kill you. If I retreat without orders, you will kill me. By September the 26th, though the city remained surrounded, the German advance had been stopped. This was the first Russian success. In Leningrad, they were confident of final victory, but they had yet to learn its full cost. The cost was heavy indeed. It was to be immortalized in bronze and stone. Unknown War will be back after this. Siege of Leningrad. At the end of September, Hitler issued a secret directive. He ordered Leningrad erased from the face of the earth by bombers and heavy artillery. After the defeat of Soviet Russia, there would be no more reason for Leningrad's continued existence, he said. Should there be any offer of surrender, it was to be refused. In the meantime, Hitler ordered von Lieb's panzers to disengage from Leningrad and move south for the attack on Moscow. The siege guns stayed. came the Russian winter. At first it seemed like a new adventure for the Germans, a vacation in the snow. The Nazis could not yet imagine what it would be like to fight the Red Army in a winter campaign. to pound the city. In Leningrad, 60,000 men and women volunteered to support the regular civil defense units. The city's anti-aircraft fire was effective and warnings came in good time. So the casualties from bombing and shelling were kept comparatively low. had come early in 1941 and it would be severe. It added to Leningrad's trials. In December, the streetcar system ground to a halt. For Leningraders, in those bitter days of 1941, everything was at stake. Life, honor, happiness. 
they and the city they loved would be judged by how they responded to this mortal challenge. The city water mains froze solid. Pipes burst in apartments. Water had to be hauled from holes chopped in the ice of the Neva River. All traffic stopped. In the bitter cold of their apartments, the Leningraders began to burn, little by little, their furniture and their books. Firewood was almost as valuable as life itself. Famine came. By the beginning of winter, rations had already been cut five times to a starvation diet. Blockaded, Leningrad had hardly enough food to sustain life. Bread was made from wood cellulose and the dust from flour mills, mixed with cottonseed cake, as bitter as quinine. The ration was two slices a day, four and a half ounces. They mixed cookies out of carpenter's glue and fried them in turpentine or paint. By now, people were scraping the wallpaper off their walls to eat the paste. The soldiers volunteered to cut down their own rations to help the civilians, but this was impossible. Soldiers needed strength to fight. To lose a ration card meant almost certain death. November, the hunger deaths began. They would reach a total of more than 600,000 before the siege ended. There was a certain order about death in Leningrad. The elderly went first, quietly. Men died before women, then teenagers. Death could come at any moment, in any place. Even to infants, gone before they had a chance to live. The birth rate dropped to zero. People began falling on the streets, dying where they lay. For the living, the corpses were evidence of their own fragile hold on life. Even some who tried to drag their own dead to the cemeteries themselves died on the way. Those who survived fought on. The unknown war will return in a moment. The siege of Leningrad. Nazi pressure was unrelenting. The temperature was dropping. It reached five below on the 14th of November. As the winter wore on, it seemed that even the meager bread ration might vanish. It didn't matter to this woman, who remembers what it was like. I came in and said, Papa, I won't eat my bread ration. If I stay alive, I want to show posterity what kind of bread we had to eat in the siege. My father said, you'll die. I said that if I eat it, I still may die. And perhaps even if I don't eat it, I may still stay alive. Oh, it was so terrible. That's why I wanted to keep that bread so the children could see it and know how we lived. It's hard to imagine now what we had to endure during the blockade to survive. 
что нам пришлось блокаду пережить. In spite of the hardships, most of the plants in Leningrad continue to turn out munitions. manager remembers. Above all, when you recall it, you're astonished by the firm belief people had in their victory. You know, it seemed at the time when things were so hard, there were no grounds at all for such a belief. Take evacuation, for instance. It was a much more difficult problem than trying to get supplies to the front line. It was hard to persuade people to leave the city. They just wouldn't move. They said, we'll win. We'll beat the enemy soon. I'm not moving any place. Even today, I can't really understand some things. I keep remembering one of the former. He said, I know I'll die in three or four days. I said, what nonsense are you talking? Why on earth will you be dead in three or four days? But he did. Three or four days later, he died. These weary people sensed the moment their stamina would give out completely. In those days, you needed greater courage to live than to die. People worked long shifts, 16, 20 hours, in spite of the hunger and cold. As Leningrad history put it, at night the occasional flicker of fires and the red flash of exploding artillery shells lighted the gloom of the vast factories. But the Leningraders seemed to possess an indestructible will to survive. Leningrad is not afraid of death, they said. Death is afraid of Leningrad. It was more than stubbornness, more than determination. It was a quiet, indestructible dedication that lasted until death. Death that took almost all of these. didn't understand that. They had a little food, a little light, a little heat. But they carried on their intellectual life. The distinguished architect, Alexander Nikolsky, wrote in his diary, better die than surrender. I am confident that the siege will be lifted. He designed an arch of triumph to celebrate the victory he believed inevitable. Dmitry Shostakovich was finishing his seventh symphony. He called it his Leningrad symphony. It was to be performed in Leningrad in the Philharmonic's damaged concert hall, while German shells still burst outside. The musicians came from the front line for the occasion. A generation later, the remnants of the same orchestra reassembled to perform the same masterpiece to the original audience. Only the survivors of the war were there. The conductor, Elias Berg, was one of the few who had survived.
Supplies came in from all over the country by whatever means were available. But they were a trickle. There were too many mouths to feed. Partisans in villages outside the surrounded city, deep inside the German lines, brought in what food they could, risking their lives. They were near starvation themselves. But winter unexpectedly opened a road to salvation. Lake Ladiga, north of Leningrad, was open on one side. The question was, would the lake freeze solidly enough this year to support the trucks? The ice held. The convoys brought food in and took people out. The Leningraders began to call it the road of life. But it took three days of convoys to supply Leningrad for a single day. Early in January 1942, Leningrad was still on the knife edge of survival. Never had the city been closer to starvation. It was the most frightful period of the siege. But what did come in saved many lives. The convoys continued for as long as they could, as long as the ice beneath would hold during the thaw, even though some trucks vanished through shell holes they could not see. Spring of 1942 brought new hope, but it did not erase the memories. The city began to stir. It was not a rebirth, just a reaffirmation of life. People were very weak from lack of food, some so feeble that their bodies could not accept the nourishment they were given. They died of eating. But now the Leningraders attacked the mountains of rubble. The streetcars went back on their tracks. In one way, the city had been fortunate. In spite of the effects of starvation, there were no epidemics, as everyone had feared. It was as if the people would not allow themselves to be sick. As the spring began, the starving people renewed their battle for survival. Freighters reappeared on Lake Ladiga. A pipeline was laid on the bed of the lake to bring in oil. Motorboats towed in tanks full of fuel. fuel came in along ramps now underwater. The city squares sprouted vegetable gardens. Every inch of soil available was put under cultivation, even close to the front line. Goebbels had predicted, Leningrad is doomed to die of famine. But the people hadn't heard his prediction. Now another honor could be added to the record of Leningrad's achievements. Not a flag or a banner, but a recognition of their survival to be treasured no less than the mementos of former military victories. The Unknown War will be back after this. The Siege of Leningrad. More than a year had gone by and Leningrad still lived. The German army faced a second winter in the woods outside the city. It would not be their last. Another Christmas.
another winter making gifts for their children far away. cities of Germany, the children received their Christmas gifts from loving fathers they could scarcely remember. The same fathers who were shelling Leningrad's children. Christmas parties in Leningrad were held in bomb-proof shelters. Every child got a present, a sad little lump of coarse black bread. children in Germany and in Russia, heirs to the outcome of this titanic struggle. A child's existence in Leningrad was down to the bare essentials. As far as possible, the children were kept to a familiar routine. A time for play. A time for school, but school in a shelter. children of Leningrad became acquainted with death before they could learn the sweetness of life. the children discovered early what it was to bury a mother or a father. One of the children, Tanya Sabicheva, kept a diary throughout the siege. Genia died December 28, 1230, in the morning, 1941. Grandma died January 25th at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uncle Vasya died April 13th at two o'clock in the morning, 1942. Loka died March 17th at five o'clock in the morning, 1942. Uncle Losha, May 10th at four o'clock in the afternoon, 1942. Mama, May 13th at 7.30 in the morning, 1942. The Sabichevs died. All died. Only Tanya is left. And then too, Tanya died. Today in 
Leningrad, the memories are not allowed to die. This is Piskorov Cemetery. It's quiet now in this great expanse of Leningrad soil, in spite of the visitors. A fitting quiet, for 600,000 people are buried here, some say more. The total number of dead from the siege of Leningrad may have been as high as one million, and most were claimed by famine. Today in Leningrad, it's difficult to find anyone, any family, who did not lose a loved one during the 900 days. This tragedy will never be forgotten by those who survived. No disaster ever visited on a city exceeds in magnitude or intensity the suffering of those 900 days. Mama, I returned the bread that you gave me. Others recall what they lost, the young, the innocent, the brave. As 1943 began, the Nazis reaped the whirlwind. Hitler had conquered other cities in days, other countries in weeks. Leningrad had defied him, invincible. Now she would reply. Some of Hitler's troops eventually did enter Leningrad, but not as conquerors. The first major Soviet offensive launched nearly 200,000 men on two fronts on the Germans in their defensive positions of concrete and steel, some three stories deep in the ground. When the Russian pincers met, they had punched a corridor to the outside. Leningrad was no longer an island. Leningrad had survived an ordeal that had started six months before Pearl Harbor and extended until six months before the Normandy invasion. The 900-day siege of Leningrad, the longest ever endured by a modern city, had come to an end. The Nazis had left hundreds of thousands of Leningraders homeless, destroyed 526 schools, 101 museums, 71 bridges, 1,000 factories, inflicted $80 billion worth of physical destruction taken one million lives. The poet Olga Berkholz wrote, From the place of death and ashes will rise the garden as before. I firmly believe in miracles. You gave me that belief, my linen grass. But as they savored their deliverance, there was still more than a year of fighting facing Leningrad longer still to the end of the unknown war. Our next story, To the East. An heroic movement of people 
entire factories, treasures, equipment of all kinds beyond the Orals and into Siberia. There, everything was reassembled to build anew for the fight against Germany. It was one of the least known struggles in the unknown war. Wednesday, Europe becomes embedded in the ideals of communism, fascism, and Nazism on World War I. Now stay tuned for Cities at War, next on A&E.